Morning. For y'all that don't know me, I'm Matt. I'm the campus pastor in Pecola. I am glad to be here today. And if you're in Pecola, I will be back next week, I promise. Uh, y'all just enjoy the show. Uh, if you're online, thanks for joining with us. Uh, hope you can uh, celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ at home today as well. Um, I uh, like history. Uh, it drives my wife nuts. Uh, and I'll just take this moment in time to say happy anniversary to my wife. Been married 24 years today. Uh, So I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, y'all can cheer about that. That's awesome. She put up with me for 24 years. And uh, I just love history. I always have. I've always liked reading about different things. And one of the things I really enjoy is is reading about World War II. Uh, Because I think it goes without being said uh, that it really was one of the greatest generations of of people we've ever had in the United States. These These were guys who literally, if they couldn't go to war, would commit suicide because they could not serve their country. I mean, these are guys that truly wanted to uh, sh- bring freedom to the United States, bring freedom to their families, and, and keep the world from being an oppression. But if you look outside of our kind of limited scope here in the United States, there were people all over the world that were doing exactly the same thing. Uh, Jason talks about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer a lot of times and how he was a, a minister in, England, or in Germany who, who literally tried to uh, help with a plot to kill Hitler, ended up dying right before war was over because Hitler woke up one night and remembered that he had something against him and had him hung. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer today. I'm going to talk about another person who you may have heard of, may have not, and her name was Corrie ten Boom. Now, if you don't know who she is, uh, she was a lady who was from uh, Denmark. She was uh, part of the Dutch resistance at the time. Uh, She was a Christian. Her father was a Christian. They were very devout. And what happened is as the Jews fled from other countries, they would come through their city, and if possible, they would help them. They said that she said that the first time one came knocking on the door, her father went to the door, and they began to plead their case with him, and they were fearful that he would either turn them in or turn them away, and once he found out they were Jews, he felt a, a, a calling to help them out. It became so uh, evident that this was a calling on their life, they actually built a uh, hiding area in Corey's room that was big enough for six people to hide. And they became so famous in the Dutch resistance that they actually sent an engineer uh, to develop an alarm system that if people came to their area of the town, they could set off the alarm and they would know to send those people to that hiding place. Well, what happened to Corey Tim Boom is after a while, uh, she, she actually decided that she needed to do something more, and they would go and get these ration cards. And to get a ration card, you had to be a Christian. You could not be Jewish. You couldn't even have any Jewish descent. They, they really thought that if you had, even if you were non-practicing, if you had three Jewish grandparents, you were a Jew. That was in the eyes of the Germans. That was in the eyes of all the people around. And so they couldn't get food. They basically starved them out. And Corey said she went to the guy that gave out the cards one day. And as she was there, she was going to get the cards for her family. And the man asked her how many cards she needed. And instead of saying four or five or six or whatever it was for her family, she said a hundred. And she said as she said it, she knew immediately, oh, that's the wrong thing to say because this guy could be one who's loyal to the Germans. He could turn me in. And instead, the man was very loyal to those around him, and he gave her a hundred cards. She began to hand them out to Jewish people who couldn't get food otherwise, and that's how they cared for these people. One of the Jewish resistance people actually turned on them, and they went to the the Germans and, um, sorry, one of the Dutch resistance turned on them and went to the Germans, and and what happened was they raided the home. And when they raided the home, they took her entire family and put them in concentration camps. Her father, who was elderly, died 10 days into the the ordeal. Uh, Corey, this happened early in the the winter, somewhere around February, and in December, she was still in this concentration camp. She had been switched around a few times, and her sister had actually died in early December. Uh, Corey uh, had tried to plead with the Germans, and the one thing she didn't understand is she pleaded with them and said, I'm one that takes care of those that can't take care of themselves. I take care of the ones that are mentally disabled. I take care of the ones who are physically disabled. And what she didn't know is that in Germany, there were actually ad campaigns saying, should we spend our money to care for these people? Let's just euthanize them. And so Corey, she was doing God's work. And she was doing the things she was supposed to do. And still, she suffered greatly. She suffered greatly. Now, at the end of December, she got turned loose and she was able to leave. Uh, but the suffering was the same. She had already lost her father. She would lost her, her sister. She would lost several other family members to the concentration camps. 
And you got to wonder if she thought it was all for nothing. Did this really accomplish anything? Did all her suffering, was it really worth it? Now, she wasn't suffering because she'd made bad choices. She was suffering because she'd actually done what the Bible would tell her to do. She was suffering because she had proclaimed what the gospel was by living it out in her life and seeking after people who could not help themselves and helping them. And so you got to ask yourself, in your own life, have you ever suffered that way? Have you ever had experiences in your life where because you were a Christian, because you shared the gospel, because you proclaimed this truth that the world didn't believe, have you ever suffered for that? And as you think about that, what I want to do is I, I want to walk you through a piece of Scripture in Acts. I want to walk you through a piece of Scripture that talks about the disciples, and it, it speaks of a time when suffering came upon them. Now, we know from the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a story, right? Luke wrote this story. He went around, he, he first wrote the book of Luke, and he wrote this account of what happened as Christ was born and walked through his life through the cross. And then he wrote another account from the cross on of what happened as the apostles went out and the church began to spread throughout the world. And so it's a story. It's not really prescriptive in the same way that, that we would read it and say, okay, because they did these certain things, we should do them as well. But it's very descriptive in the fact it's just telling the story of what happened. Now, what happens as we read story, a lot of times it gives us examples we should follow. It also gives us examples of what might happen to us as we go through life. And so as we read this, I want you to be thinking about that as, as they were persecuted for their faith. How have you been persecuted for your faith? So if you turn with me to chapter 5 of Acts, we're just going to read a little story here about the apostles and what happened to them as they walked through basically their life and ministry and as they saw the church grow. We're going to start in, in verse 14 and just read a little bit. And it, it reads like this. It says, And more than ever believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So what's happening here is the church is growing. We've had Pentecost. We've had Peter proclaim the gospel. Thousands are saved. We've seen him. And the apostles, they went out throughout Jerusalem. You've seen all these people begin to come to Christ. And as they're doing it, miracles are happening. Things are happening that honestly never happened before uh, other than when Christ was, was doing them. Miracles to the point that as people would be in the street and Peter would walk by, his mere shadow would heal them. And see, you got to think that uh, this is going on. People got to be getting excited. And they are. They're coming from towns around. They're coming to a location where they can see the apostles. They can see what they're proclaiming. And you got to think that even possibly the priests, the Jews, they got to be thinking, hey, this is prophetic. These are the things that the Old Testament, that the Torah, that all these books have talked about happening, and now they're happening. So you think they'd be excited. You think they'd be fired up. You think they'd be thinking, hey, maybe there's something to this. Maybe we should investigate this. Maybe we should be a part of this. Well, let's read on. It says, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them into prison. So you got these guys who are the spiritual authority of the Jewish, of the, of the nation of Israel. These are the guys that, that proclaim basically what the Old Testament is preaching. They're the ones that, that you would go to for any guidance, any wisdom. And it says, as they looked at the apostles, they were filled with jealousy. They were jealous that people were going somewhere else other than them for the truth. And they weren't concerned with what really the truth was. They were just concerned that people weren't seeing that they were proclaiming it. They weren't looking at them and saying, you're the ones, you're the highest, you're the, you're the example. These would have been the guys that probably could quote majorities of the Old Testament, if not all of the Old Testament. These are the top of the line guys. These are those people that got more letters behind their name than the alphabet has. And yet when they look at these fishermen 
who had walked through life with Christ for three and a half years, and as they proclaimed a gospel that they didn't believe, they became jealous. They became jealous to the point that they actually had them thrown in jail. And I'm thrown in jail because they did not want them proclaiming it and perverting basically what they would say. And as they were in jail, the story goes on. It says that an angel came to them. An angel came to the apostles while they're in jail. And this happens more than once as you read throughout the book of Acts. That an angel came and he freed them. And as he freed them, he said, go and proclaim the gospel. Go and continue to do what you're doing. And it says that the, the apostles waited till sunrise and they went back to the temple they started preaching again. Now think about that for a second. If you've ever been somewhere and you've ever been preaching the gospel and someone came up to you in authority and said, go away, don't come back. They probably didn't throw you in jail, hopefully. But they may have discouraged you and told you, get out. Don't be preaching that stuff anymore here. We don't need it. Did you wait till sunrise and come back and do the same thing? See, that's what the apostles did. That's what Peter did. He, he began to proclaim this gospel again, and it goes on. It says that the, the priests start looking for them. They send for them, and they, it says someone told them, hey, look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. That's what verse 25 says. See, the priests, they were going to send for them. They sent for them, and when they went to the jail to find them, they were gone. They had no idea. The priests were clueless. How in the world did they get out? They're probably looking at these different guards, wanting to know who they need to kill, because honestly, that, that was the penalty. If you were a guard and you lost the people put in your charge, you died. And see, they were jealous. They were angry. They were, they were just wanting to know why these people could be so defiant. And so they sent more soldiers to get them. And when the soldiers got there, they were fearful. Not of the priest, not even of the disciples, but of the crowd. Because they saw this crowd who was seeing miracles happen, who were seeing people they loved healed. They were seeing things they had never seen in their lifetime. They were hearing a message proclaimed to them they had never heard. And they knew it was truth because the Holy Spirit was speaking to them. And as they got to them, they were fearful to pull them away, kind of an aggressive way. So they basically just kind of tapped Peter on the shoulder and said, hey, would you guys please come, to us, come with us? And see, Peter and the apostles, they wanted another opportunity to go before the priest, I believe. And so they went away kind of quietly so the crowd wouldn't riot. See, think about that. Not long before, there was a crowd that was going to riot as well, but they were going to riot because they were saying that Christ needed to go to the cross. They were saying that he was a heretic. They were saying that he was wrong in every way. And now probably some of that same crowd had come to know the gospel, and the people in charge were fearful of them because they might riot if they pulled their people away. See, Peter's kind of a guy I can relate to. Peter's a hothead. Right, he, he, you know, he's a fisherman. He was a rough guy. Uh, he said some really dumb stuff as he walked with Christ. One time, he said, "Christ, you don't have to die." Of course, Christ rebuked him, rebuked him and called him the devil. I mean, that, I can I can relate to that at times because I say some dumb stuff. But see, Peter was a hothead, and it kind of didn't carry over into his ministry as far as being a hothead, but it helped him to be bold. That as the Spirit gave him the ability, he became very bold in his speech. And he says this. It says, uh, the priest looked at him and says, we strictly charge you, this is in verse 20, uh, 28, it says, we strictly charge you not to teach in his name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with the teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witness to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who will obey him. And Peter just calls him out. They say, how dare you go against us? The high priest says, how dare you? I am the authority. I'm the one that calls the shots. And Peter goes, no, you're not. 
that should I listen to man or should I listen to God? And if I'm supposed to listen to God, then here's what God proclaims. He proclaims a gospel. It says that he sent his son to die for the sins of this nation, the sins of this world. That you and your people put him on a cross to die. And yet God exalted him and put him at the right hand of the Father. See, Peter's bold. He knows that by doing this, his life is basically in their hands, that they, they control his outcome. And this big discussion begins among the Jewish leaders. They begin to talk about what they should do. And there's a wise old man. It actually ends up being the uh, rabbi who taught Paul, who was Saul at the time. And he begins to talk to these younger guys and says, hey, it's real simple. We've had this happen before. Little sects have rose up. And as they rose up, things have happened, but, but they've always kind of went away over time because people kind of become discontent with them or the leader kind of goes away or he dies or he just can't fulfill his promises. And he says, so what really needs to happen is you just need to leave these guys alone. Because if they're not from God, then it'll just dwindle away and it'll be nothing. But if it's from God, Nothing will stop it. See, he was wise in some ways. See, he was very wise to know that if it's from God, it would go away. I mean, if it's from God, it would not go away. But he wasn't very wise in the fact that if it wasn't from God, see, we've got other things. We have Islam. We have Mormonism. We have Jehovah's Witnesses. We have all these other things that man has made that they have actually proliferated throughout the world. But he was absolutely correct in the fact that it was, if it was from God, nothing those priests could do could stop it. Nothing could make it go away in any shape or form. And so they kind of convened again, and they, they talk some more, and they come up with this. And this is one of Justin Jackson's favorite portions of the Bible. In verse 40, they look at the apostles, and when they had called, uh, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, this is the apostles, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple, and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. I want you guys to think about that. These priests took these men aside. They beat them. And when I say they beat them, it wasn't a small beating, I'm sure. They knew what they were doing. They had guys that that was their entire job was to just beat people. And they beat them and sent them away and said, don't do it again. Same thing they had said before. And as they left, they rejoiced in the fact they got beat. Anybody ever got beat down by somebody? I got licked a couple of times when I was a kid. I never went away rejoicing over it. Never. I might have went home to my mama and cried a little bit, but I never rejoiced. But see, as these people left, they rejoiced over the fact that because they were proclaiming the gospel and because they knew it was true, that these Jewish leaders decided to beat on them. And they said they felt honored that they were found worthy to have that happen. And it doesn't say they quit doing what they're doing. It says they continued to spread the gospel. They continued to go house to house. They continued to go into public places. They continued to do all the things that these people had told them not to do. Because they listened to God rather than man. And see, the question I pose to you is, is have you suffered for your faith? I'm not talking about have you suffered, because we've all suffered, and a lot of times it has absolutely nothing to do with anything we've done. It's just the sinful world we live in and the brokenness, it affects us and it causes us to suffer. But what I'm saying is because of your faith, have you ever suffered? And when you suffered, how did you react? Did you, did you run away? Did you clam up? Did you quit proclaiming the gospel that caused you to suffer? Or did you rejoice in it? And see, I know we live in America. We live in a country where we have religious freedom uh, and we believe that, oh, this, this could never happen to us. But what I want to do is I want to show you a few examples of how 
you could possibly suffer for your faith. One of the ways you could suffer is you could suffer in your relationships with others. Um, when I was in college, I had a roommate who had been my best friend since the second grade on. And in college, I met a guy who, who really challenged me, who, who helped me grow in Christ. And, and I really became on fire for who Christ was and what he meant to me in my life. And I've been really proclaiming it. And I remember walking into my dorm room late part of November, and all my roommate stuff was packed up. And he told me he was moving out because he couldn't stand the Jesus stuff anymore. And I can remember how heartbroken I was that like, this is my best friend. This is the guy who like, I had planned on walking through the rest of my life with as a, as a close friend, as a best friend. He was, like, going to be the guy who was going to be my best man when I got married. And I remember our relationship, it was pretty much done at that point. I mean, we talked a little as we passed each other in the halls, but, I mean, that was pretty much it. Like, all that time, it, w- it was done because I had proclaimed a gospel that he didn't want to hear. And see, some of you have probably lost friends because of your stand for Christ, because of the way you proclaim the gospel, because of the way you live your life. There are people who have probably shunned you and pushed you away. And the real question is, how did you react to that? Did you rejoice in it? Because I'm going to tell you, like, in the midst of that initially, young in my faith, I did not rejoice in the fact that my friend was gone. Because I truly didn't understand what God was trying to do with what he did. And see, some of you, you're going to make a stand for God and people are going to walk away from you because of it. People you hold close and dear, they're going to walk away from you because you stand up for Christ. And the real answer is not if that will happen, it's how you will react when it does. The other way you may suffer is you may suffer in your own family. Um, I have a close friend, the one that actually helped me when I was in college. He grew up Mormon. And as he went through life, he got into high school and had a friend that witnessed to him, and, and he came to know Christ clearly as he was. And he got saved. And he said as he came home and began to recount these things to his family, his family who he lived with shunned him. They tried to change him. They tried to make him forget everything that he knew was true. They tried to get him to walk away from, from the gospel that he had, he had come to know and love. And he said for years it was very, very difficult because he felt alone other than those he went to church with. And see, he suffered, and he suffered well. Now, he was like me. He didn't necessarily rejoice overjoyingly that, that, that this had happened to him, but he, he did believe that God was doing something, and then over time his family actually came to Christ. And he said, looking back, he wished he had rejoiced in the suffering because he knew it was working towards the good of his family. You may suffer as well just in the world at large, maybe, maybe in your job, maybe in the places you're at. Uh, uh, we went to China a couple of times, my family did, and the first time we landed in a city called Chengdu, which is a huge metropolis of a city. And as we left and come home uh, not long after, uh, there was a pastor and his entire church that were taken in the middle of the night. They were taken from their homes, their, their houses were ransacked, every book was taken, uh, their church building was ransacked. And uh, Pastor uh, Yang Yi was not seen again. This was late 2018, and he was not seen again until 2019 in December when he was sentenced to nine years in prison. He was sentenced to prison simply because he was proclaiming a gospel that the people around him didn't like him spreading. His people were kind of scattered. His wife and his child were not arrested, but they weren't allowed to see anybody they went to church with, anybody they had been living life with. They were forced to move away. Every time they left their house, and to this day when they leave their house, they're followed by somebody in the Communist Party to make sure they're not doing something they shouldn't do. But what happened was a few days after uh, the pastor was put in jail, a a message came out from his church, and it read like this. It says, I firmly believe that Christ has called me to carry out this faithful disobedience through a life of service under this regime that opposes the gospel and persecutes the church. He went on to say that if God chooses to put me in jail and I have to suffer in that way, it is all worth it. 
See, he suffered well. He rejoiced that he was found worthy. This is a guy that not long before was actually in Washington, D.C. with then-President Bush being celebrated for the fact that he was doing so much for the Chinese people. And see, least you say, well, China's a different place and their constitution doesn't guarantee everything. It actually does. Lawyers have looked at his case and they've proven constitutionally by China's constitution that what they're doing is against their own laws. But yet they do it anyway, and he suffers all the same. See, I tell you all these stories, I tell you all these different people because we live in a time and place where we may be forced to suffer for our faith. That we probably, in a, in a small way, suffer now, but in the future we might suffer in ways that are beyond what we can even imagine. And see, the question is, is will you rejoice in your suffering? Will you continue to proclaim the gospel even when they're telling you not to? Will you listen to God and not man even when listening to man it would be so much easier? See, Corey Tim Boom, she was a watchmaker. Her and her father, she had said she had sat at her father's side for hours watching him put watches together. And so not long after she got into the concentration camp, she was actually sent a letter, and they allowed her to get it. And all it said was, the six watches you had in the chest are fine, and they're safe. And she knew the Jews that were hiding in the house had got away safely. That though they had all went to prison, they hadn't found them. She found out that she was let loose on a technicality that, I mean, a paperwork mix-up and that she wasn't supposed to be let out when she was. She also found out about 14 days later, every woman of her age was sent to a gas chamber and was killed. Corey Timbu never doubted that God was with her in the midst of it all. Even through all the suffering she went through, even through all the death of her family, even through all that she had to watch and see, all that she had to experience in those concentration camps, she never doubted that God was at work in her life. She died in her 90s, still proclaiming that God was good and that God was faithful and that despite everything that had happened, she felt kind of honored that she was allowed to suffer. So the question is, when you suffer, will you be like her or will you run away? Will you be like her? Will you suffer well and be found kind of an honor to suffer for his honor? Bow your heads with me. Father God, I just come before you this morning. I am grateful for your grace. I'm grateful for the protection you've given us here in this country for so long that, Lord, we can freely proclaim your gospel. God, we can come before you. God, we can gather like this. We can, we can go into the public areas and, and proclaim your word and, and, and not feel like we're going to be persecuted by the government or anything else. But, God, I also know it could be a time where it's not like that. And I know we need to be prepared to be just like the apostles. We need to be prepared to be just like the men who, who proclaim that they should listen to God and not to man, that in the midst of suffering they should find it as an honor. God, I pray that we would be found worthy as well. I pray for those here today, God, that they, they may be suffering for their faith. I pray, Lord, you would encourage them. Allow them to know they're in good company, God, that they stand in the same place that Peter and the apostles stood. And that, God, they can believe that you are there with them, helping them proclaim your word. I pray for those that are here that don't know you, God. Maybe they don't understand even what I've been talking about. I pray that your spirit would begin to draw them, God, and that through your spirit, God, they would come to know who you are and the sacrifice you've made for them. God, I am grateful. God, that you have allowed us to go through the times we went through. And God, I, I just now look back and rejoice, God, that at times I was found worthy to suffer for you. Thank you, God, for your grace. We just ask this, Father, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.